Okay. Morning. Um, so we were talking about the DNA viruses, and this morning I'm going to switch and talk about RNA virus strategies. Uh, but before I do that, are there any questions on the DNA virus stuff I talked about? Okay. So the RNA virus strategies are somewhat different because the RNA viruses have got different strengths and weaknesses as opposed to the DNA viruses when it comes to parasitizing the host cell. And so, again, I want to go into a little bit of an overview of these before we actually go into the details of individual virus families. Uh, so, if we take viruses, that RNA viruses that are going to stay as RNA all the time, because some of them go through a DNA phase, those are the retroviruses, the rest of them stay as RNA for their entire life cycle, uh, and I want to talk about these. Uh, so if you take an RNA virus that is going to copy itself at the RNA state, at the RNA level, all of this copying is just going to be the same as you have with DNA. The one strand of DNA is copied into the complementary strand, and then that is copied back into the original sense strand. So if we were to arbitrarily call one of those Watson and Crick, Watson's copied to Crick, Crick is copied to Watson. Uh, but if this is all happening at the uh, RNA level, then what you need is an RNA polymerase which copies RNA. So those are known as RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. And if they're going to DNA, then you'll need an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase to copy that into DNA. And that's what's known as reverse transcriptase because normal transcription in the cell is copying DNA into RNA. So this is the reverse of that, copying RNA into DNA. And the point I want to make about both of those is that our cells, at least, uh, do not seem to provide either a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase or an RNA-dependent polymerase because we do DNA to RNA. We don't do RNA to DNA. We don't do RNA to RNA. So our polymerase, our RNA polymerase, is of no use uh, to these RNA viruses because it doesn't use RNA as a template. So what that means is all of the animal RNA viruses since they don't have, we don't provide them with anything that will copy RNA, have to code for an RNA-dependent polymerase to copy their RNA into something else. Uh, <coughs> so all of these RNA viruses that we're going to talk about are going to have to code for their own RNA polymerase because we don't provide it. So... Number one thing is every one of these is going to have to have a gene coding for a polymerase. So we have to take that as a set thing, but there are some other aspects of this polymerase activity that we need to think of. Uh, and for that, that's going to depend on the kind of RNA that these viruses package. So let me just take these one step at a time. Uh, some of these viruses package single-strand RNA, some of these RNA viruses. So if you package single-strand RNA into your virus particle, if it's the same sense as message, which is by definition positive sense, that's what we mean by positive sense RNA when we're talking about these viruses, if it's the same sense as message, then it has, when it gets into the cell, it can be immediately translated into protein. So, this virus has to code for an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase because we don't provide one. Uh, but it can make it once it gets into the cell because it puts the message into the cell. This is translated into proteins, and one of those proteins will be the virally coded RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So for the plus strands, it's pretty easy. But when it comes to the negative strands, you have a bit more of a problem because they're putting in an rna which is the opposite sense to message. So this has to be copied into message sense before it can be made into proteins. So this needs the RNA polymerase as the very first thing when it gets into the cell to make its messages. And it can't make the RNA polymerase in the cell unless it, uh, before it's made messages. So where is the RNA polymerase going to come from to do this very first step? And the answer is for the negative sense viruses, it has to take the RNA polymerase in with it. So 
So this is somewhat similar to the vaccinia situation we talked about yesterday. So since it will need that RNA polymerase as soon as it gets into the cell in order to make messages, and it can't make any protein until it's made messages, it needs to package this RNA polymerase in the virus particle. So what we have for the negative sense RNA viruses is they, they code, just like all of these viruses, they code for an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, but in this case, it's in the virus particle. <clears throat> so it was made in the previous round of infection. So the RNA polymerase must be packaged in the virion, and if it's going to modify this message by capping and methylating it at the 5' prime end, or by polyadenylating it at the 3' prime end, it needs to include the RNA modifying enzymes in the virus particle as well, so that the first messages it makes look like authentic messages. And that is the case for these viruses. Um, not all of them do provide the modification machinery. You'll see a few exceptions as we go through. Um, but one thing is, if you don't provide capping, methylating, and polyadenylating enzymes, uh, they're there for a perp the, those modifications on the RNA are there for various purposes. Uh, but some of those purposes are important in efficient translation and in stability of the messages. And so if you don't cap or, model, cap or methylate or polyadenylate, you have to do something extra to these messages so that the protein translation system recognizes them efficiently uh, and also so that they're reasonably stable. So you can't just ignore the rules. If you don't do these things, you tend to have to do something else to make up for the fact that you didn't do this. So in a way, you don't win anyway. Uh, so, but, and we'll see some of the things that some of these viruses do to make up for the fact that they don't cap or methylate, or in some cases polyadenylate, although I'm not going to go into that in so much detail. Okay, question? By positive sense viruses are those in which the single strand RNA that they package is the same as message. So it could be translated into protein. The negative sense ones are those in which it's complementary to the message strand and therefore it can't be translated into proteins. It has first to be copied into the complementary strand, which will be the plus strand, and then it will be copied into proteins. Okay, any other questions? Sorry, for those of you who didn't hear the question, it was basically what is a positive sense RNA. Okay, so what about double-stranded RNA? Now, double-stranded RNA, of course, their RNA would include the positive sense and the negative sense. So you might think they might be able to function as RNA, as message sense RNA when they get into the cells, since one of the strands is the same as message. Uh, but it turns out that our ribosomes can't unwind double-stranded RNA. Uh, and so the double-stranded RNA would not work as message anyway. Uh, and so these still have got the same problem as we had before. They need, first of all, to use this double-stranded template in this case in order to make messenger RNA. So again, they're going to use, need to take their RNA polymerase in with them because they can't do anything. This won't be translated into proteins, uh, so they can't do anything until they've made good message. And so, again, they need to take this enzyme in with them. So the RNA polymerase here will need to be packaged in the virus particle, and if used, so will the RNA-modifying enzymes. So they, they have talked about the basically the three, the three classes of RNA viruses that replicate at the RNA level. They put in the message strand, they put in the strand complementary to message, or they put in both strands. And I just briefly want to mention the, virus, the retroviruses, which are going to go through a DNA stage. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this because you'll hear this in much more detail from Dr. Richard Hunt later on in the course. Um, but here, when you put the, retro, the retroviruses, they've actually packaged message sense RNA in their virus particle. So when it goes into the cytoplasm, you might think, well, that's fine. It can just be translated, and they can make their polymerase after they get into the cell. They don't have to take it in with them. Uh, but that's not the case, because actually what they do in their life cycle, and you'll see this in a lot more detail later on, is they copy their positive sense RNA into DNA. 
Um, so the positive sense RNA is copied into a negative sense uh, DNA strand, and then they actually use that as a template to copy that negative sense DNA strand into a positive sense DNA strand, so you get double-strand DNA. And then that is, goes to the nucleus uh, and is integrated into the DNA. But all of this occurs within inside the virus particle. So this positive RNA is basically devoted to being used as a template to convert the virus from RNA to DNA, and it's not used as a message. And in fact, since it's inside the capsid, it doesn't get into the cytoplasm and the ribosomes don't even have a chance to translate it. So for the retroviruses, the positive sense RNA is being used as a template for DNA. It can't be translated. You don't make the polymerase um, at this stage uh, because it doesn't get to be, the, the RNA doesn't get to be used as a message. And so again, you have to take the enzyme here is the reverse transcriptase, as I pointed out earlier on. It's copying RNA to DNA. We do the opposite reaction. So this enzyme has to be taken in with the virus. So all of these animal RNA viruses have to code for their own polymerase. We don't provide an RNA-dependent polymerase that will copy RNA into anything. Um, but some of them uh, have to actually package it in the virus particle because the polymerase is the first thing they're going to need when they get into the host cell. So we can just summarize that quickly here for the RNA viruses. The plus-stranded ones can make the polymerase after they get into the cell because their genome acts as message. Uh, so they don't need to take the polymerase in with them. So if you get naked RNA, which isn't very stable, but in the lab you can do it, and if you put naked RNA into a cell using lab tricks, it is infectious uh, because all the virus particle is doing here is delivering a messenger RNA to the cytoplasm so it can be translated. And if you just put the RNA into the cytoplasm artificially, uh, then it can be translated. For the negative-stranded RNA, they need to take in a polymerase, as do the double-stranded RNAs, because their genomes do not act as a message when they get into the cytoplasm. So the first thing that happens is, for the negative sense and for the double-stranded RNA, is their input genome has to be copied into messages. So that's process... The making of messages is known as transcription. And that means that if you put naked RNA into their cytoplasm, nothing will happen because there's no polymerase to copy it. And if there's no polymerase to copy it, the virus goes nowhere. Um, so this has an impact on which sense you are depends on whether or not you take the polymerase in with you. And as I pointed out, for the retroviruses, because... Although they put plus-stranded message sense RNA in the virus particle, it's not infectious because it has to undergo reverse transcription as the first stage. It has to be converted to DNA and get into the nucleus. So this is not used as a message. It's RNA, input RNA. Uh, you need the reverse transcriptase, therefore, has to go in with it. Uh, and if you put in naked RNA, uh, retroviruses are not infectious. They need that reverse transcriptase. So, any questions? So, that's one aspect of RNA viruses. They have to deal with this problem that we don't provide a polymerase to copy them, so they have to code for it, and some of them have to take it in with them. Uh, they face the same problem as that we've already talked about when we talked about the um, DNA viruses, and that is that we have this problem that our ribosomes, animal ribosomes, eukaryotic ribosomes, um, treat RNAs as if they were monocystronic as a rule. So what they do is the small ribosomal subunit binds to the cap group at the five prime end of the message, recognizes that, scans along until it finds a good start codon, which I show here by the boundary between the cross-hatched and the solid. And then the region that's shown as solid will be translated into protein at this start codon um, the large ribosomal subunit will assemble on and then you'll get a full ribosome and translation will start till so you meet a stop codon and then the ribosome falls off. So if you had a second message down here, which I've shown in purple, uh, this message would never be translated. So this is called basically a monosystronic RNA because it's just codes for one protein. So when we look at the RNA viruses, how do they deal with this? And there are various solutions to how do you deal with making 
uh, a lot of proteins. And the simplest one, of course, is you make one monocystronic messenger RNA per protein. Uh, and many of our proteins are made that way. So that's one thing. But if you're going to do that, you obviously have to provide a promoter for every protein, so you've got to provide all that upstream sequence to go with each protein. Or one of the things that we've seen with things like SV40 and adenovirus is you can make a primary transcript and use alternative splicing to generate a whole number of messages from that initial primary transcript. And that's of another option that's available to the RNA viruses. But the RNA viruses don't use that very much. And one of the reasons appears to be, if you think about it, what are they going to go to the nucleus for? Splicing is in the nucleus. So that would be one advantage of going to the nucleus. But the DNA viruses, if they go to the nucleus, they stand the chance of parasitizing our DNA replication machinery, but we don't provide any RNA replication machinery. Um, also, if they go to the nucleus, they provide, they stand the chance of getting our capping and methylating and polyadenylation machinery. But as I pointed out, that machinery is associated with the RNA polymerase complex. And if you don't make the RNA, if you don't use our RNA polymerase to make the message, uh, it doesn't get capped and methylated and polyadenylated because those enzymes are associated with that little factory. And the RNA viruses the ones that stay at the RNA level, and I'm only going to be talking about that for the rest of these lectures because the retroviruses are going to be dealt with later. But for those RNA viruses that replicate always at the level of RNA, um, they, don't, they never have a DNA template that our RNA polymerase can use to make messages. So they don't have access to our capping and methylating and polyadenylating enzymes either. So the, if they're going to use splicing, they have to go to the nucleus, but the nucleus isn't the treasure trove for them that it is for the, RNA, for the DNA viruses. Excuse me. Uh, so it turns out that most of these uh, replicate in the cytoplasm. Um, if you think about it, what, kind, what are they going to get in the nucleus? And about the only advantage that we currently can think of um, is that they would have access to splicing. So if you avoid splicing, you just can replicate in the cytoplasm uh, and just get on with things immediately you get into the cell. And so there are a few viruses that go to the nucleus, RNA viruses that go to the nucleus, and we'll talk about flu, which is one of them. But most of them do not. So alternative splicing is not a, 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 does not seem to be widely used. And if you're in that sort of situation, then you have to think of some other ways apart from making one monocystronic RNA per protein. Um, there, there may be other ways around this problem. And so some of the peculiarities of the RNA viruses just seem to be that they're using some of the other ways. And as I've said before, these viruses are not terribly original. These other ways are used by us in our cells as well as ways to get around the monocystronic problem, but we use them rarely and the viruses use them commonly. So one thing is to make a very large protein, which is usually called a polyprotein, and then you just cut it into smaller proteins. So you just have, here you'd have one cistron, but it would actually consist of a whole part of different proteins which you could just make by using a protease. And that protease you may code for, or the virus may code for, or the cell may code for. We'll go into some of those. Or you can include special features in the RNA which enable the ribosomes to bind internally so this kind of message can be actually used to copy more than one protein because you'll put a sequence in here which ribosomes can bind to and recognize. And those, again, we occasionally use them, um, but the viruses use them quite frequently. So these sort of weird things about viruses are just, as I say, because they've all got this same problem. Okay, so they're going, we're going to be looking at how they get around this problem, and that's one of the things that each family tends to take a slightly different uh, approach, but there's an overall, what you can think of as a goal um, that they have. Okay, another thing I want to talk about the, about the RNA viruses, and we'll come to this in a little bit more detail in the genetic lecture, um, but our basis, I don't know if you've come across the word tautomerization, uh, but the basis in the DNA double helix, uh, or outside of the DNA double helix, uh, bases spend most of their time in that classic form that's shown in the Watson-Crick double helix where A bears with G and C bears with C. But for a finite, very small fraction of the time, they spend a little bit of time in a tautomeric form where the, uh, the distribution of electrons around that ring is slightly different. 
And that results in, for a very tiny fraction of the time, A will behave as G and vice versa, and C will behave as T and vice versa, T will behave as C. So that means that if at the instant that the polymerase incorporates a nucleotide into the growing chain, that base is in its rare form, it will behave as if it was the opposite base, G as C and so on. I, I mean A as G or G as A, C as T, T as C. And that means that inevitably you'll have a mutation rate. That's just because of the chemistry of the bases. There's no way you can change the chemistry. These bases are in equilibrium with a very tiny percent of this rare form. So we get around that by having proofreading. And so if we incorporate the base in that rare form a few seconds or microseconds or picoseconds, whatever, later, it will be back to the original form. It will look like a mismatch and we will repair it. But... We repair it when we're making DNA because it's double-strand DNA. We have DNA repair machinery that recognizes a mismatch in the DNA. And you've all heard about some of that in your biochemistry lectures. But that repair machinery is devoted to DNA. So the DNA viruses can use our repair machinery. Or again, it seems that at some stage they've, ha they've got some of the same features. They've sort of snaffled these regions of the proteins involved in repair probably, uh, and they've got repair. But RNA repair is nothing that we're concerned about. If we make a faulty RNA, it gets degraded, it doesn't code for the right protein, it's not a problem. We pr provide lots of RNA, so one or two fake RNAs, and that's okay. Uh, but for the viruses, when it's a genomic material, that's going to be a problem. It's going to have a mutation. Uh, but they don't have access to the proofreading mechanism of the DNA, and it seems that they've never acquired an RNA proofreading mechanism of any major significance that we're aware of. So these viruses don't seem to be able to repair those mutations. So, as I say, there seems to be a lack of proofreading if you're RNA. And the consequence seems to be that RNAs have small genomes, uh, and if it may, that may, the conclusion may not immediately seem obvious, but if you think of something like herpes virus, which has something like 200,000 nucleotides. If it has a mistake once every 20,000 nucleotides, then one in 10, uh, sorry, each virus would have 10 mutations. And the chances are very high that those mutations would make that virus less able to replicate and compete against the regular wild type virus. Uh, so 10 mutations per replication would not be acceptable to herpes, but it doesn't make 10, 10 mutations per replication uh, because it uses proofreading. In fact, it has some of its own proofreading machine. Uh, but if you look at the RNA viruses, uh, they don't have access to proofreading. If they had one mutation every 20,000, if they had a genome that was 200,000 base pairs, they would have those 10 mutations because they can't proofread. So every RNA virus, if it was 20, 200,000 base pairs long, would have that kind of 10 mutations, say. And that's about a decent error rate, get taking your tautomers into account. So what that means is that if it was this big, every virus would be mutant. If you had the average size, say, 10,000 nucleotides, then 50% of these would have a mutation if it's one in 20,000, and 50% will be okay. And that's probably acceptable to an RNA virus. If half of the stuff that comes out is good, okay, you can get away with that. And remember I said that most of these viruses uh, have a, the virus, each individual virus particle, um, very frequently is not infectious that's produced, and we, we have an infectivity rate of something like one in 100. And part of that is because you get these mutations. So for the RNA viruses, they're going to have small genomes. And it turns out that 10,000 is about a, a decent average size for many of these RNA viruses. And that's apparently because this is controlled by the error rate up here. Uh, so with these RNA viruses, they're going to have small genomes. They might have a large virus particle, but inside it's going to be a small genome. And that genome already has to code for a polymerase because we don't provide a polymerase. If they're going to modify their RNA in any way, it's going to have to code for the RNA modification enzymes. It's going to have to code for a nucleocapsid protein to protect the DNA. And if it's enveloped, it's, 
it's going to need to code for an additional attachment protein that goes into the envelope. If it's not enveloped, then the nuclear capsid protein can function as an attachment protein. So you've only got 10,000 nucleotides, and you've already got to code for, at a bare minimum, a polymerase and an attachment protein. And polymerases tend to be rather large proteins. So you're not going to code for very many proteins. So these, virus, these RNA viruses have relatively few proteins. You don't see this sort of early, late, and elaborate machinery going on uh, because they have just small genomes, relatively few proteins. Sorry. <laughs> Nothing seems to be happening. Okay. So are there any questions on that before I go on to the next? What I said is, yes, well, um, what I said is because the nucleotides always spend a little fraction of their time in this form that, behave, that, that they basically behave as if they were their opposite, then when the RNA, sorry, the question was, Oh, what did I say the error rate was? Yes. Um, because of this business about these tautomeric forms, um, the active sites of the polymerase can slightly affect that equilibrium, but not very much. They can't prevent it. Um, and it seems that the error rate is around 1 in 10,000, 1 in 20,000. It depends slightly from one polymerase to another. So I took for the example, I took about 1 in 20,000 as a sort of average error rate. So if you have a genome that is 10,000 long, then that would mean that if one in every 20,000 bases is wrong, it would mean that one 10,000 genome would be okay and the other one would have a mutation in on average. Okay. And that would mean that you could manage about 10,000, but once you got to be 20,000, every genome would have an error in it. Uh, and if you were 200,000, then every genome would have 10 errors in it. And as I say, the DNA viruses can get that big because they have access to proofreading, but the RNA viruses apparently don't. Is that clear? Okay. Okay. So uh, I want to start going into individual life cycles and try and see how these principles are applied when we talk about them. I'm going to start off about talking about positive strand RNA viruses. Those are the ones that put the message sense RNA into the cytoplasm. Um, I'm going to be talking about picornaviruses, pico meaning small, RNA meaning RNA viruses. Um, but other viruses that we will talk about when we come to talk about um, some of the insect-borne diseases are the togaviruses and the flaviviruses, uh, and we'll talk about those later on. And they use variants of the picornavirus. They're not identical to the life cycle we're going to talk about for the picornaviruses. Um, but should we start to need to know about those viruses, what I'm hoping is that if you understand the basic principles that underlie the picornaviruses, then if you come to read about the flavivirus life cycle or the togavirus life cycle, um, you, I hope you'll see that they have variants on this but they're basically under the same rules uh, and they just have come up with minor differences in the solutions to the problems. But basically that's what these RNA viruses do. They're, they're individual peculiarities. And when you look at it, it just make common sense as being solutions to the problems that RNA viruses face. So, poliovirus, I seem to be going backwards quickly. Poliovirus belongs to the picornavirus family, so does do rhinoviruses, the common cold viruses, um, so do does hepatitis A virus. So you'll be hearing about these um, in, different, in lectures from other people later on. Um, so I just want to just mention at the moment so that when you come to look at them, but you'll be hearing, for instance, about a lot of things like polio and some of the other uh, members of the, uh, the coronavirus family, largely from Dr. Ganjemi, uh, but you will also hear about hepatitis A virus uh, from... Um, Dr. Duffers? Okay, so PICO means small. These are pretty small particles, uh, around um, 
20 nanometers or so. Don't worry about the size, just so that I can give you a feeling. Um, they are icosahedral naked nuclear capsids. Um, they have positive sense RNA and they're non-enveloped. Uh, and if you look at these, these represent the soccer ball type of model. Here are the pentons, which have got five neighbors, five-fold symmetry. You can even see they look like a five-pointed star. On the surfaces of each triangle here, um, there's this subunit capsimer here, um, and there's one on each face of the 20 triangles. This is actually made up of three proteins, and, and it's got six neighbors, three pentons, three other exons. Okay, so it absorbs to the cell surface, and somehow or other, the RNA gets into the cell. Uh, in some cases, it appears that these viruses uh, get their RNA directly across the plasma membrane. In other cases, it appears they have to be taken up by endosomes, and it goes across the endosome membrane. Uh, but what does seem to, to occur is that the capsid proteins are capable of forming a channel across the cell membrane, and that the RNA goes through that channel and into the cytoplasm with an attached protein on it, which we'll come to in a minute. And then it can be immediately translated into protein. So, simple start to the life cycle. Now we meet one of the complications of the RNA virus. Um, poliovirus does not have a capped or methylated 5' end. In fact, it has a protein attached to the 5' end, and we'll come to the function of that protein later on. But at the moment, for translation, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter whether it's there or not. Uh, it's not used in translation. Uh, the ribosomes, therefore, cannot recognize the 5' end of the message. So what do they, how do we get around this? Well, polio has got something here, a feature of the RNA. It's a sequence of RNA, and it's recognized not so much because it's a sequence, but because that sequence forms uh, a three-dimensional structure, and that's what's being recognized. So it's, it's the tertiary structure that's being recognized, or the secondary structure that's being recognized here. So the, this is called an internal ribosome entry site. And our ribosomes can recognize this as being somewhere to, for that small 40S ribosome subunit to bind. So it can bind here, and then it will scan along the RNA until it meets a start codon, uh, and then the 60S subunit will come on, and it will start translating just the way that our regular ribosomes, they are our regular ribosomes after all, translate. But the difference here is that instead of recognizing the five prime cap group at the end of the RNA. It recognizes this so-called internal landing pad, uh, and that's called a ribosome entry site. Now, that might seem really weird. Why does a ribosome that normally recognizes proteins also recognize these? Uh, well, one answer, it's not a why, but it's an, one aspect of this is that some of our proteins, a, a relatively small percent, some of our messages, rather, a relatively small percent also have these internal ribosome entry sites. And it seems to be a way that we, we use to respond to certain stressful situations that we stop translating by recognizing caps and we can, start, we can translate just by recognizing these. So these exist in our, gene, in our genome as well, but we only use them for a small percent of messages, apparently under rel relatively special circumstances. Uh, but polio uses it all the time. It's the only way its RNAs can be translated. Okay, so you make a polyprotein, which is going to be cleaved, and when you reach a stop codon, the ribosome falls off just the, the way that we normally do. Okay? So I just want to point out here a consequence of this. Um, in the uninfected cell, host cell messages are recognized by caps. But what polio does is it actually alters some of the factors that recognize caps. Uh, and in doing so, our cap recognition factors no longer work. So when the polio infects the cell and other members of the family, they, they all, many of them seem to be able to do this. Um, what happens is, because the factors no longer recognize the cap, we, they don't, we don't translate our messages, because our messages, by and large, are capped and methylated, and the ribosomes can no longer recognize it, because the, factors, the, the initiation factors that were needed for that have been altered such that they can no longer recognize them. So 
we don't use our ribosomes for doing our message, but if you look at the polio, in the uninfected cell, there's an internal ribosome entry site, and that can be used. And as soon as the virus gets in, in other words, before it's altered anything. But once it, once it alters these factors, it can still be translated because the altered factors still recognize the internal ribosome entry site because that doesn't require the cap recognition factors. It just requires some other factors. It does require some other factors, by the way, but those are present in the cell uh, in this case. So this means that what can happen is polio can switch off host protein synthesis by and large uh, because if it destroys cap recognition, most of our messages will no longer be translated. So our cells are eventually going to die. Uh, but meanwhile, it's got free range of using as many of our ribosomes as it can. Any questions? Okay. So that's one, you know, we talked about cytopathic effects and if you remember, which you almost certainly don't, I showed you a, some slides of poliovirus infected cells and they were just ripped apart because for one thing, the host cell is no longer making very, very much in the way of host cell proteins. So, genomic sense RNA translated into a polyprotein. The polyprotein is cleaved by a series of steps, which I don't want to worry about, into the final proteins that the virus needs in order to uh, replicate. Um, that includes the proteins that are required for replication, uh, the proteins that are required for capsid assembly, and the protease that does these various, or the proteases that do these various cleavages. Um, so this, these proteases are going to be doing these cleavages. So one question you might have is what cleaves to the first polyprotein? And the answer is the first polyprotein has got protease regions within it, and they can actually work while the polyprotein is growing. And instead of growing, we usually use the word nascent, which means exactly the same thing. Um, so if you look at the, it, the nascent polyprotein, it is cleaved before it ever you get to the end. So if you were to look in a poliovirus infected cell, you wouldn't find the poly, very many molecules, if any, of the full length polyprotein because it's cleaved as it's made uh, by the viral proteases. So in order to do this, polio is providing its own protease or the other coronaviruses as well. Question? So you said the protein, Yeah, the question was, was the protease a structural protein? And no, these proteases are not structural proteins. Um, the virus doesn't have to take them in with it because since its first thing is going to be translated, it can make them when it gets into the cell. Okay, so now you've got the capsid proteins obeyed. The proteases are made, and the enzymes for RNA synthesis are made. So you can start replicating your RNA. So the genomic plus sense RNA is copied into minus sense RNA, and the minus sense RNA is then used as a template to make more plus sense RNA. Pretty straightforward. Um, one thing is, you'll notice at the five prime end here, these are all made in the five prime, three prime direction. All of these polymerases whether they're viral RNA polymerases or host cell RNA polymerases or DNA polymerases, they all work 5 prime, 3 prime. Um, the 5 prime end has always got this VPG on it. And that appears to be, we think, because these coronaviruses use VPG as a primer for replication. And uh, RNA polymerases normally don't need a primer, but in this case, they use this as a primer uh, and this then is used as a primer, so it's at the five prime end of the message. And so it will be at, at, at the, the message here, but it, when you copy it in negative sense, it will be at the five prime end of the negative sense genome. It'll be at the five prime sense of the positive sense genome. So the VPG appears to act as some kind of um, primer type function during replication. Uh, it also appears to play roles, which I won't worry you about, but it seems to enable um, the virus to sort of control the flow of RNA what, uh, in, in the cell. So it, it's, uh, it has other advantages just than being uh, a part of the primer. Okay. So RNA replication uses the viral RNA polymerase. And since this is um, replicating, it's called a replicase. Uh, but uh, it's just a polymerase. Um, 
and host cell factors are used as accessory proteins. So it doesn't have all the proteins it needs for RNA synthesis. It uses host cell factors, but these are apparently host cell factors that virtually all of our cells, or at least the cells that infect, must have in the cytoplasm. Uh, they, they seem to be relatively common host cell factors. They, they, they don't seem to limit the virus too much. And now you make new plus strands since you, when you go through that. And so you can, the new plus strands are what needs to go into the virus particle. So a new plus strand can be packaged into a virus particle. Um, but of course, it can also be used as a template to make more proteins. And it can also be as a used as a template for replication. So it has all of these um, alternative fates. And obviously, initially, uh, these are going to be used for making more proteins and more replication. As time goes on, then more, more of these strands will be packaged and you'll make new virus particles. So you've got your new RNA. You made your proteins by this relatively simple polyprotein. And of course, one of the f features of the polyprotein is all of the proteins are going to be made virtually instantaneously. You're not going to see early late. So assembly, what happens is you assemble these proteins. Again, VP means that they're structural proteins that are found in the virus particle. Um, and what we find at the moment is there are going to be four proteins, four of these major capsid proteins. But at the moment, one of them has not yet been cleaved, and we're calling that VP0, which is why I've got it in gray, VP1 and VP3. So these form a immature capsid particle, and the RNA enters... And exactly how the RNA gets in, we don't know, but it's the RNA that gets in has got the VPG attached. Actually, VPG is often lost from some of the RNA, and it can still function as message without VPG, but it only gets packaged in the genome if it's got VPG, which is one way in which the virus only packages its own RNA and doesn't package host cell message or something like that. So the VPG enters into the virus particle, and once the VPG is in the virus particle, VP0 is cleaved to VP2 and VP4. Uh, and that cleavage apparently occurs because some protease activity is activated once it gets into the virus particle. And it's not at all clear what that protease activity is. Uh, but one thing is it seems that the protease activity may require um, the RNA, the three prime end of the RNA, in order to become active. So it, uh, it's... But the exact nature of that protease is, is currently not entirely clear. But what that cleavage does is it now tightens up this capsid. Um, so I've tried to show that this is relatively loose. This is much tighter. So this is much better armor against the big wide world when it gets out of the cell. Uh, I'm not going to ask you, is VP0 cleaved to VP1 and VP3, or is it cleaved to VP2 and VP4? I don't know. But uh, I'm just pointing out there are four in the mature capsid, there are four proteins, and one of those came because there's this late cleavage which tightens the capsid up once the nucleic acid is inside. Any questions? So what you see, these capsids, again, you make huge numbers. So not all of them have got RNA in them, and not all of them have been cleaved, uh, but they, they form these regular paracrystalline arrays, semi-crystalline arrays in the cytoplasm. This being an RNA virus, um, most RNA viruses, as I say, are cytoplasmic. So here you will see the inclusion bodies in the cytoplasm, not in the nucleus. Uh, eventually the cells were lice. Uh, the virus has actually done a lot of rearrangement of the host cell membranes. Um, it's done a lot to decrease host cell protein synthesis. Uh, and so the cells are getting pretty sick by this stage. They eventually lice and the viruses are released. Okay. Any questions on polio? Okay. So other RNA, positive strand RNA viruses use variations on this basic RNA virus life cycle. And as I say, I hope that if you need to look into those in more detail during the rest of your careers, you'll find that the logic uh, can be extrapolated to those. Okay, what about negative strand viruses, and I'm going to split those, first of all, into the ones which have got a single chromosome, the non-segmented negative strand viruses, and then we'll talk about the segmented uh, ones a bit later on. So if we talk about non-segmented negative strand viruses, 
Some examples are rhabdovirus, which includes rabies, which is what I'm going to start off by talking about. Paramyxoviruses, which include things like uh, mumps and measles. And filoviruses, which I'm not going to go through their life cycles, um, but those include uh, ones like um, Ebola and uh, Marburg viruses. Relatively rare, but extremely dangerous. Okay, so I'm going to start off by talking about rhabdoviruses. Uh, that includes, as I say, rabies. That's the one that's going to be of most significance to you clinically. Uh, but if you're reading about these, you will see references, and I will probably mention as we go through, to a virus called vesicular stomatitis virus, which is a virus that causes vesicles around the mouth, so that's why it's stomatitis, of various farm animals, particularly cows. Uh, and it can infect humans, but it's a mild disease, and you, you, you're not unlikely to see it in your clinical practice. But it, it's uh, been widely used to look at rhabdoviruses because most people would rather work on something that's relatively safe than rabies. Uh, and so very frequently what you find is for these really um, in, medically important viruses, frequently people have looked at safe relatives because of the difficulty of working with um, dangerous viruses in the lab. So, vesicular stomatitis virus uh, is the sort of one that's had a lot of work done, but rabies virus is the one that's clinically important. And if you look at these, um, they're membrane, they're enveloped, and if you look, I'm not sure you can see the details there, um, but if you look on the PowerPoints, uh, you'll see that what, you can see what looks like the edges of the slinky, so these have got helical symmetry, uh, and you can think of them as shrink rat slinkies when you look at the virus particle. Question? Yeah, the, the non-segmented RNA virus, the question is the difference between segmented and non-segmented. The non-segmented RNA viruses have got a single piece of RNA forming their genome. So you can think of it, although we don't normally refer to it with viruses as one chromosome. The segmented viruses have got multiple pieces of RNA making up their genome. So you can think of that as having multiple chromosomes. But again, we don't usually use the word chromosome for viruses. We use segments. Okay. So getting into this... Oh, sorry. I'm zooming ahead. Um, so here is the diagram of the virus. Here's the helical nuclear capsid. So there's a single-strand RNA negative sense inside it. That is coated with the nuclear capsid protein, which is known as N for nuclear capsid. Um, this is a negative sense RNA, so it's going to need to take its polymerase in with it. So the complex is there, and it is actually associated with the nuclear capsid. And it's a couple of proteins that form it. Um, this is an envelope virus, so I've shown the lipid bilayer membrane in green here. Um, and into that membrane is inserted the attachment protein, which is known as G in this case because it's a glycoprotein, so it's G for glycoprotein. Uh, we don't have a consistent nomenclature in these viruses, unfortunately, because each individual set of virologists who were looking at each individual virus brought up their own nomenclature. Um, uh, but and underneath that membrane is a protein called M um, for either matrix or for maturation. It plays a very important role in maturation. So that lines the inside of the membrane. And it's that simple. It's just got these five viral proteins. Okay, that's a good place to take a break. So we'll get it into the cell after the break.